Today's guest is Nelson Delis. Nelson is one of the leading memory experts in the world. He is traveling all around the world as a memory consultant and keynote speaker. He's a four-time USA memory champion. Uh, he's a mountaineer. He's an Alzheimer's disease activist. Uh, he received the elite grandmaster of memory title as well as number of US memory records, such as memorizing the most names and words in 15 minutes. So I'm really excited chatting to you, Nelson. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, uh, to kick off, I do have the following um, question for you. What is the most impressive thing you've done using your memory to this day? Oh, uh, I think it would have to be a few years ago when I made the challenge of memorizing uh, 10,000 digits of pi. Um, and so, I mean, that's not too difficult. I mean, that's difficult, but it took a lot of time. But the challenge in how I was tested, I think, was pretty challenging in itself. Um, it wasn't just me reciting all the numbers. It was somebody asking me um, specific portions of the 10,000, and I had to know exactly what it was and what came after and before. Uh -huh. And you were able to memorize all of the... 10,000, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I had all 10,000. Uh, the challenge, I was trying to beat a record. I didn't beat the record, um, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's an endurance kind of challenge, so it was very tough, but I still had the 10,000 digits. Really? So you still remember it to this day after you've learned it? Uh... Um, not completely. Uh, I, have, I haven't brushed up on it just because it's a lot of uh, maintenance, um, but I still know about... I, I've relearned since then about the first one to 3,000 just to have kind of um, uh, there, you know? Got it. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I really love unpacking people's backgrounds. I think it holds lots of uh, nuggets and lots of uh, lessons there. So I thought maybe we can talk a bit about your background and kind of what led you into the topic of uh, memory. Sure. Um, so I, you know, growing up, I had a very strong interest in mathematics. Um, and in college, I started studying math and physics. I was just really fascinated by understanding and learning how the physical world worked and being able to describe that with equations and uh, mathematics was a dream to me. I always wanted answers and that was the way I got my answers about the world. Um, and then I was really fascinated by a lot of my teachers and lecturers in physics who were very good at calculating uh, numbers in their head. That's what got me interested in kind of exploring this world of mental gymnastics in a way. And a lot of people who are good with calculations actually are very good with mnemonics and memory as well. Uh, and so that kind of all happened around the same time as my grandmother um, getting Alzheimer's and getting older and um, eventually she passed away. And so all of that together kind of pushed me to really get interested in the mind and what's capable of the mind and what could I do for myself to make my mind sharper and faster and better at calculations and better at memory. And then that's where everything took off. And I found the memory championship and wanted to, to win that. And, and that's where it's led me to today. How did you find the memory championship at the time? Uh, this was 2008. Um, I had heard about it uh, just by, you know, researching online things about uh, people being able to do feats of memory that were improbable. And, uh, you know, I heard of other stories of people in the past or special cases of people who had, um, who were autistic savants like Kim Peek, the Rain Man, um, but then a lot of what I found, I always get, got driven back to people who were memory athletes or memory experts competing in memory championships. And for a long time, you know, I thought at first that it was just for people who, you know, were gifted with memory. And then I slowly saw that a, a theme kept reoccurring, and that was that nobody at these competitions was gifted. Uh, they merely were training their memories with techniques. And once I discovered that that was like a common answer that a lot of competitors gave, I was like, okay, well, maybe there's something there that I could do myself and maybe I have a chance to win uh, or compete highly at these competitions. Really? So you think that anyone that won the USA Member Championship, including yourself, they don't have any specific talent which allows them to actually get there? 
I don't think so. Um, if, if anything, maybe it's just the, the, the desire to, or the enjoyment that I have when I train my memory. Maybe not everybody likes that, um, but I worked on my memory every single day, um, obsessively. Um, and that's, I guess, what made me good enough to win. So what do you think makes um, someone be able to win the memory? Is it just training, using the right tools? What other components other? Uh, yeah, because the, the techniques aren't too difficult. Uh, the broad idea of them is fairly understand, uh, easy to understand. Um, but then you have to develop these systems to be able to memorize some of the difficult information like numbers, playing cards, dates, binary numbers, all those kinds of things. And that takes time and a bit of strategic effort. Um, so my friends and I who compete, we, we always say like, it, it comes down to how much time you spend sitting on your butt, just studying, you know, right. uh, and training uh -huh. Smart, smartly, yeah. right? It's all about like uh, purposeful practice. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. And what made you actually decide to go into the first championship. I'm guessing many people can hear, maybe people will hear the podcast, will hear there is such a thing as memory championship. I know most people will not want to start training to become right. one or go there. So what made you like look at it and say, I'm going to be there and I'm actually going to win it one day? Yeah, you know, the, the first time I competed was 2008, was it? No, 2009, I'm sorry. Um, and this was actually before my grandmother passed away, but she was in a bad state. So it was already something I was interested in. And I went to that competition, not quite yet telling myself I was going to win this. Um, more than anything, I was just fascinated by everything. And I wanted to explore what this world was like. And at the very least, I told myself, like, this is experience. This is something I need to do just to get a feel for it. And then let's see. Let's see how it goes and maybe how it impacts me for the next time I compete and maybe I'll be more motivated. Right. So, and this is what I tell people who are interested, you know, but don't, don't worry about winning. Don't worry about setting records. I think getting your first competition or going to a competition is just so enlightening. Um, even if you have no plans of ever becoming a champion or a crazy mental athlete, it's one of the coolest events you can go to just to meet the people, just to understand what, these people are doing with their memories um, and being a part of that, you learn so much and really realize what's capable of the mind. So for people listening out there, even if you don't have plans, I, I highly recommend going to at least watch one of these in person or compete. It's, it's a really fascinating experience. Can anyone sign, just go and sign up to the championship? Yeah. Basically? Yeah, yeah. There's no like qualifying uh, really? requirement no as of yet. Um, so the U S championships usually, every year around March, April, and you can just sign up on their website, which is I think usamemorychampionship.com. And then for the world championship, same thing. There's uh, every year, usually at the end of the year, there's a three day competition and anybody can sign up. Really? And where did you go to actually study the topic? Like, did you have any mentors, any books? Like where does a person in general yeah. goes and learn? To it's not something like common, I think, which is out there <laughs> yeah. at least in schools or, yeah, in the culture. Yeah, I mean, now it's better. It's easier to find information. Back when I started in 2008, 2009, uh, it was very minimal stuff on the internet. Um, I ended up having to find a book, an audio book by a former champion called Dominic O'Brien. And the book was called Quantum Memory Power. You can probably find it uh, used on eBay or on Amazon. Um, but it's like an eight CD uh, audiobook. Uh, I'm sure you can download it, right? Uh, I'll hand it down and, and link it in the show notes yeah. if I find it. Yeah. But it's it's so. great. You just I, I was working in Chicago at the time, and I had I didn't have a car, so I'd walk everywhere and I'd work to walk to work and listen to this audiobook. And it was there's exercises on it, and and he convinces you that you have a good memory and all that good stuff. So it was really uh, an important book in helping me find my interest in. Um, these techniques. Mm -hmm. Are there any other books which people um, can get on a topic? So that one's good. Um, but uh, since then, I've written my own. Um, so that's called Remember It. And it's available on Amazon and anywhere. Um, I think it's better uh, because I've <laughs> learned from what he wrote and I've kind of 
made it as, as complete as possible. It's not just for people who want to compete in memory competitions. There is some of that information in there, but it's also for general people who want to improve their memory for work, for life, for studies. Um, very common day-to-day -day things that people complain about for their memories. Um, and I, I, I like to think that it's a very memorable book. It's very colorful, lots of diagrams, pictures, um, very casual conversation like I'm talking to you now, it's kind of how the book is written to make it as interesting as possible because things are memorable when they are um, interesting and not dry and boring, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, could you maybe walk us through um, a few examples of how to improve the memory, how to have a sharper memory, uh, not necessarily to become a world championship, uh, but just to start remembering things better. Are there a few things people listening in can start doing and get out of the call and have a better memory afterwards? Yeah, sure. So uh, I always tell people to start with kind of the intent, um, really thinking to themselves how, if they tried, um, how much better their memory would be. And it's, it sounds so simple, um, but it's actually quite difficult to try to use your memory um, because maybe if you're about to, you say, well, why do I have to memorize this? I can just put it on my phone um, and keep it there, or I can write it down, or I can put it on my computer and save it. Why should I even use my memory? And even, you know, trivia and useless facts or databases of knowledge that in the past people had to just know if they wanted to know them. Now you just ask Siri and she'll oh tell you what it is, right? Oh um, so that's the first step is, is really having that intent. And then the question to answer is why should I do it? Right. If I could just use my phone instead. Well, the answer to that is, is from a health perspective, you're training your memory while you do that. You're exercising your brain. Think of 10, 15 years ago, how much better you probably were at memorizing things because you had to, right. Um, you know, back when I was in high school, we didn't have cell phones with massive amounts of, all our contacts, we actually had to look up in a book our friend's phone numbers, right? That was the alternative. Otherwise, you have to memorize it and then you can do it really quickly. So I still remember a bunch of my friend's phone numbers from when I was a kid. It's ingrained in my head because I had to memorize it. Um, the alternative, like I said, was spend five minutes going through the stupid book, finding the book every time, right? Um, but now you just search a name and there's your phone number. So if you try, if you say, I have to memorize this, then you're going to have a better chance at focusing at it. And then that's going to help you remember it. And at the same time, you're actually doing a gymnastics with your memory, you know? Are there specific beliefs some people should have if they want to improve my memory, maybe? Or that's a great, me? great question. Yeah. So that's another thing is a, there's a lot of misconceptions about what memory is and what people think of their own memories. And I hear a lot of people say that they have a bad memory and they just, sure. many people it. say it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a cop out. It's, it's, it's not a, a true thing to say. Sure. You may think you have a bad memory, but I'm proof. And so are other people who compete that memory is something you can actually improve on if you give it a bit of uh, massaging, right. And you work on it. So everybody can have a better memory. It's just how you think about it. And one of the worst things for your memory is saying to yourself that you have a bad memory because it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. You just mm -hmm. tell yourself you have a bad memory, you don't try, and then it just feeds itself. But as you get better and more confident in your memory by using it, um, it actually gets even better. Um, and that's something I've learned over the years, training it every day. Um, some of the times when I train the best is almost when I don't even think about it. It just is is an extension of me. And, and that only comes from practice. Um, so that's, that's one of the things um, that people need to get out of their heads is that, that they do not have a bad memory. They just mm -hmm. don't practice enough. Or, you think or nobody enough. on earth has a bad memory in your opinion? No. I mean, there's got, obviously got to be a spectrum of people who are naturally better with their memory versus people who are naturally worse. Um, but I think it's way better than, uh, most people give themselves credit for. Um, another thing is, is that people think that there's people out there who just have photographic memories. Um, and like I said, it's a sliding scale of, of people who have, you know, better than normal or worse normal memories. But I honestly don't think that 
photographic memory exists, especially in the way that people talk about it, where, you know, you have a book and you can just open it, close it, and then you have it all in your head. That, that would be photographic memory, right? Because you took a picture of it all. I've never seen that. I've never seen anybody compete at a memory competition claiming to have that because, hey, they would win if they did. Um, and I've never met anybody in real life who could do it either. So that should help people with their confidence because I think what happens is people see or hear that somebody has an amazing memory just naturally. And then that gives you self-doubt because you're like, I don't have that. So how can I ever be that? Um, but that's not the case. You can become better than those people who think they have a, a very good memory just by training and using techniques. And that's what I've become. I never had a good memory. I definitely didn't have a photographic memory, but I could beat anybody who claims that they have a photographic memory uh, in any kind of memorization task. Interesting. So could you share a few techniques or a few things um, that you can do to start practicing or to memorize better, kind of anything, any example which comes to mind? Uh, yeah. So the, the thing with memory is it, it does sound kind of dry and boring. Like, oh, okay, I got to train my memory. That means I have to practice memorizing. That sounds horribly boring, right? It reminds you maybe of school and studying for hours, stress, anxiety, um, but you have, so you have to make memory fun, right? So, um, what I tell people is what's your goal, right? Or, or what do you, what would you like to do with your memory? Um, is it to compete in a memory championship? Is it to memorize a deck of cards? Is it to memorize, you know, all the winners of, you know, Wimbledon championships because you love tennis? I don't know. Um, or to be able to memorize people's names every day, wherever you go. Um, Whatever the thing is that you like, that is what you should use to train. Um, because otherwise you're gonna get bored and it's gonna become a task that you force yourself to do every day and you're not gonna enjoy it and your memory's gonna not get any better. So let's say you do wanna compete in memory championships. Great, so what you could do is you learn what's at these competitions, what do they do? They memorize numbers, cards, names, all these kinds of things in a certain format. And you do that every day, like little exercises, right? Um, just like you would go to the gym to get your biceps bigger. You do curls, right, with your biceps. Or you do squats to get your legs stronger. Um, but you, you have a thing in mind where you say, oh, I want to be able to do heavier squats. So you work on your legs. So if you like memorizing names and you'd like to get better at that, then that is what you should practice every day. And um, if you want to memorize poetry, then that's what you should work on every day. Uh, just a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. got it and if someone wants to memorize names for example better i know lots of people uh go to parties social events they don't remember sometimes the names of people yeah. uh what what can what can someone do to go to a party and actually remember everyone's names yeah so the, the first thing uh, going back to what i said before is to go in with intent so if you're about to go to a party um i would suggest telling yourself kind of like a mantra in your head I want to learn, you know, 10 people's names. You, you set some kind of goal, right? And you say that that's what you're going to do at this party. Sure, you're going to have a good time. You're going to drink, whatever, whatever you want to do. But by the end of that party, you better know 10 people's names, right? Um, and just that little uh, kind of motivational nugget will make you focus on memorizing names. And suddenly you're in this different mindset where you're thinking, I want to improve my memory. I'm going to work on my memory. I have a goal and suddenly you have intent, and that's gonna help you get started with your memory. Now, there's a bunch of different techniques, we can talk about this, um, for how to go about memorizing things better uh, so that they stick and you get more confidence. Um, but th the intent, again, is where you should start. Mm -hmm. So you think the intent is much more important than any kind of technique uh, which you will implement, and technique is not really that important? Well, I don't know, the, the techniques are pretty, powerful but um they will do nothing almost if you don't try you know got it uh can you walk us through one technique i know i i went through your book actually before the call and like there are various techniques can you walk us through like one uh, technique for example uh, i think it will really help people listening in uh, get like as a practice how they can do it uh, yeah Let, let's take names for example so let's take names, it, yeah. In the book, I kind of talk about this. I try to keep it simple. So these three-step process, um, see, link, and go. 
Um, so basically, and this is how you memorize everything. So C is you want to try to see the thing you're trying to memorize as a picture in your mind, something that you can basically an association to something weird, out of the ordinary, in other words, memorable, right? Um, because when we get information like names, sometimes it's just a word, right? Like a word that we've never seen before or heard before, or it's foreign or very common. It's not very special. It's not very memorable. So if you can find a picture for that, it's going to stick better. The next thing is to link. Uh, and that means to attach that picture that you've created to something that's already in your head. Um, and this, this is how you learn. Um, you know, Richard Feynman, who's a, a famous physicist back in the day, would always talk about how um, the best way you can learn is to attach things you don't know to things that you do know. And that's essentially the, the, the learning process. So he would do a lot of um, from very complicated things in physics. He would talk a lot about very relatable um, metaphors. You know? So if he's talking about quantum particles moving around, uh, he would maybe relate that to a room of people you know, moving around, something you could visualize and understand. You know? And then suddenly it's like, oh, this complicated thing, I can relate to something that I already have firmly understood in my head. Um, and then suddenly you have a, a, an attachment to that thing. So this is the same process. So I come up with a picture for the name and then I'm going to attach it to something uh, concrete that will help me retrieve that information later. And the way to do it for names, the best way, it's not the only way, but it's the way I do it, um, is I choose something about the person that I notice, uh, a physical feature. Why do I do that? Well, because when I look at someone, when I'm talking to them or meeting them, I look at their face um, and I notice things without even saying anything. That's the first thing I do is we kind of silently judge someone, you know, whether they are yeah. good looking, unattractive, they have very interesting qualities, a colorful makeup or hair or whatever. You know, we notice different things. That's just the nature of who we are when we meet someone, we observe. And so if you can attach the picture of their name to that thing, um, next time you see them, you're gonna notice the same thing you notice, the feature, and then that's gonna help you remember the name. And then the last step is go, right? So that's basically adding the secret sauce to make it really, really memorable. So taking the image, taking the thing you're attaching it to or linking it to, and mixing them together, giving them a reason. Why do they interact together? Um, and then taking it out of the norm, using all of your senses to really understand and, and imagine what those connections have. And that, those three things together will make um, anything stick. So mm -hmm. let's do a quick example. Let's say you're trying to memorize my name. You meet me okay. for the first time and here's my face. Um, I say my name is Nelson, right? So the first thing you want to do is see. So you would see my name, Nelson, as some I kind would of say in my brain, Nelson, or your face. Uh, so, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to picture the word Nelson. I mean, some association to that word. So when I say Nelson, what do you think of? Right now, your your face comes to my mind. So you've never you've, you've never met me. So it's got to be something else, right? So do you know like Nelson Mandela, uh, Nelson? Nelson Mandela. For some reason, I thought about an apple. I don't know why, <laughs> but. Uh, um, so we it, can do it, an, uh, yeah, Nelson Mandela. Let's let's Nelson Mandela. It's got to have a reason, right? If you just think of an apple randomly, there must there might be some reason why. But if you don't know why, then that's not going to be very helpful because you're going to think apple and be like, what is that? What name is that? I don't know. Um, but Nelson Mandela, that's easy to picture, right? He's a very famous figure. Um, most of us can picture what he looks like roughly, um, and you know his name is Nelson, right? So that's your picture of Nelson Mandela. Then the next thing is to link. So you got to choose some kind of feature about me. So maybe you notice that I have a very, it's, it's usually red. I don't know if you can see how red it is here, but it's a bit of ginger beard. So that's the link, right? Then you go, you attach Nelson Mandela to my beard and you give it a reason. You give some kind of story to it. Why would they have some connection, right? So maybe, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela um, has been, he's been in prison um, uh, and suddenly he's grown this really red beard, right? Bigger than mine. Um, and now you've suddenly connected those two things um, and you add a bit of extra emotion and, 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 and senses. Like imagine putting your hands in his beard. What would that feel like? Does it smell? He's been in prison for a long time. Is he 
got body odor? Uh, is it dirty, filled with crumbs and food, right? And how red is it? Like you can see the sunlight glistening against the, the red beard, you know? All those little details really make it memorable. So next time you see me, you're gonna say, oh, his beard, Nelson Mandela, Nelson. What's up, Nelson, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you do this yeah. uh, in the five or 10 seconds when you see the person the first time? So yeah, that's the next thing I was gonna say. It, it seems like a convoluted process and how do you do that when you're having conversation with someone or multiple people at a party? But this is where the practice comes in, right? Um, it sounds like it's a lot of work, but with practice, that process that we just talked through happens in an instant, right? And through practice, I actually have a lot of these images for names, very common names, already set. Every time I meet a Nelson, it's Nelson Mandela. Every time I meet a Brian, uh, it's a brain. I picture a brain. Um, so I just have these pictures that I've just learned through practice and I instantly imagine that image on the person's feature. Mm -hmm. So if it would be in an event or a party and I would go to speak to Nelson again, like because I remembered Nelson Mandela with red beard and some weird story in my head, I'll write away. Remember, ah, oh, that's Nelson basically. Yeah. Yeah. And if you meet another Nelson, um, you, you know, we're not going to look the same. Um, so you, you choose some feature, maybe has a big nose or funny ears, I don't know. Um, you can picture Nelson Mandela again, or any other Nelson that comes to mind at that moment, or any thing the name sounds like. So maybe you have a name like um, Ben, right? Um, so I might think of Benjamin Franklin. And when I think of Benjamin Franklin, I think of maybe him flying a kite, or I think of a $100 bill. In the US, he's on the, the $100. Um, or if you don't know any Benjamins or Bens, maybe you think of Ben sounds like um, bend, something bending, right? So you, you try to, you have to impro improvise a little bit uh, to come up with a picture for the name, but it doesn't always have to be the same. Um, and you can kind of come up with it on the spot. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the key, you think, to remembering anything, to linking something you don't know to something you know. It can be stories, pictures in your head, weird things. That's the key to, as a broad way for improving yeah. any kind of learning. Yep, yep. And then everything that, you know, we use, um, that w every other technique that we use to memorize all the more complicated things like cards and numbers and addresses and whatever, um, takes on some form of C-Link Go. Um, it varies a little bit in how you encode or see the picture. Um, or how you link, there's different ways to do that. Um, but it's essentially the same process over and over again. Mm -hmm. That's the basis for what you use and what you use as well to win a USA memory championship, basically like this mm -hmm. idea with like more advanced techniques. Yeah. Yeah. And just to give you an example of how I use this for more complicated strategies is for numbers, let's say. So, the way I see numbers um, is I have a system where I've in already encoded every three digit possibility of numbers. So that's thousand different uh, images um, for every possible triplet. And every time I see a three digit number, I already have a picture for it. Um, it's something I've had to learn, but I now know it very well. And then when I store them or when I link them, the way I do that with numbers is I use some, a technique called the memory palace technique. And that's basically using um, physical structures that I know in, that I can see in my mind, like my apartment, uh, my parents' home, my childhood home. These are places I've been many times in, my, in real life and I can see in my head very clearly. So I will store the pictures for the numbers along a path through the, the memory palace. And it's very easy to recall those things because of the familiar, familiarity of that space in my mind. Mm -hmm. and, and again, link I'm linking it to something I know, which is my, my house. And my each apartment. picture is linked to some number. Let's say your house is 100, something like this. No, so the, let's say I'm using my apartment. This room right here is my living room. Um, I might put the first three digits starting at the doorway, which is right here. And I would picture the image of the person or thing opening the door and coming in. Okay, that's my first thought. And then, you know, as you walk in, maybe the kitchen's right here. So maybe they go to the, the next 
three numbers is another person or thing. They are opening the fridge and getting a snack, right? And then the next three would be cooking at the stove. The next three would be maybe turning on the sink. And I make a, a pathway around the space so that when I want to recall everything, all I have to do is just walk through my apartment in the same way. Open the door, go to the fridge, go to the stove, the sink, and the images of the people, the weird things that I saw there um, will still be there because it was so weird and memorable. And I can just turn those back to uh, uh, encode them back into numbers. Uh huh. And then you have like a fixed story in your head and that's how yeah. you remember a thousand different stories to remember uh, the thousand numbers. Uh, I think it's a bit less. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Sometimes so. we try to compress a lot of numbers into single images, um, but that's the general idea, yeah. And again, this sounds very, very complicated, very long and a lot of steps. Why not just memorize the numbers by looking at them and repeating them? You could do that for maybe three to six numbers, but past that, you're gonna struggle. Um, I use this technique to memorize 10,000 digits of pi. And my memory palace uh, was huge. It was all of Miami. All of the places that I know, my high school, my parents' house, um, the highway that connects the two. Um, it's a huge journey, a huge path through all of that. And you may think, how do you remember the path? Well, it's just, I try to think of it as something very um, common sense. You know, I don't have to think about it. I usually start at front, the front door of a place and I just go through something in a clockwise manner in my head. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that's very easy for us to remember. That's another part of it is, is spatial information, like uh, the blueprints of a house in your head that you know, the house you live in, for example. You could close your eyes and walk through it very easily. You don't have to think about it. You didn't memorize it. It's just there. Um, and our brains are very good at memorizing that stuff. So that's why we use it. It seems to be the most effective way to store a lot of information. Yeah, it's interesting because it sounds to me almost like the complete opposite of how they teach you in school yeah. or in life, anywhere really to memorize anything. And nobody teaches these kind of things. Uh, yeah, that's, it's so unfortunate. And it's something that I try as best I can every day to, to change. Um, because, yeah, from early schools, uh, schooling, you are told, go home, memorize this, right? Whether, whether it's a poem, the alphabet your multiplication tables, um, the periodic table, whatever. Um, they just give you an assignment and you're expected to go home and just figure it out. And the way most people figure it out is they just look at it, repeat it over and over and over again. It's boring process. It's not fun. It's very stressful, um, mostly because you memorize it, but you're not entirely sure that you're going to be able to recall all of it successfully. That is a horrible feeling. Um, but imagine you had a feeling where Every time you memorize, you know it's here and you know exactly how to get it. That would be amazing, right? Um, and so I believe that these techniques should be taught before you're told to memorize anything. Um, especially with kids, they're, they're fast, amazing with uh, their, their imagination and, and thinking in funny pictures and things that are memorable. So it should be some skill that they should learn as young as possible. How much time do you think it may take someone to learn it, a beginner or a child, someone who just wants to kind of work on starting improving memories? It's really a frame of mind, these techniques. It's like, how do you, just understanding how memory works a little bit um, and kind of this three-step process is not very complicated to, to talk about. Um, that, I think, is, is the thing that people need to learn and hear over and over again. So it's a habit. So every time you have information, you think in that, in that way, oh, okay, I got to turn it into a picture and I got to find a way to link it to something I know. And then I got to make it very interesting um, so that it's memorable. If you can do that with everything you memorize, that's like an instinctive kind of uh, habit that you, you, you do every time you try to learn something, then that, that's the valuable part. Um, everything else is just stuff you figure out, the strategy, how, are, how am I going to make it a picture? What's the way I'm going to do that? Or what's the way I'm going to link it and store it? Those are all things you can figure out or, or read techniques online, or uh, it depends what you're memorizing, right? How the strategy will change, but the basic foundation for the technique and the way you think about memory should be the same. 
So if I get it right, for example, if I want to get out of the conversation is after I finish talking to you for day to day, when I see things, all I need to do is just practicing in my head, the go uh, link, see go, just on the yeah. go, kind of doing it on the go consciously. And this alone will make me have a better memory. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, when you're driving or walking around, there's, there's so much information around you that you could try to picture and, uh, you know, try to encode into some funny way and, and connect it to something you know. And you may not remember everything because you still have to have the intent, um, but the practice there and how to turn information very quickly into these kind of mental images uh, is very, very helpful and crucial to having a fast and powerful memory. Got it. Um, are there any other components besides uh, mastering the intent, uh, having maybe the right techniques? For example, um, how, how does diet and lifestyle affects the memory? Uh, yeah. So, so aside from techniques and and thought, um, yeah, there's a few different things that affect memory um, that are physical or environmental. Um, diet is a big one. So, what you put in your body definitely will affect the way you think. Um, I've experimented with a bunch of different diets, but I think what overall overarching themes is that um, processed foods, sugars, um, things like that are, are killers for your memory. Um, just because you, you get such a heavy brain fog sometimes, and when you eliminate those kinds of foods, you just can feel a lot sharper. And being sharper, you have the benefit of wanting to actually think and, and focus on something. And then when you can do that, you can remember better. Um, so that's a big thing. And then there's certain kinds of healthy foods that I eat to help improve my memory. Um, Which foods? Uh, number one thing is, is uh, omega-3 uh, DHA, which is a fatty acid. Um, you can find it in salmon and uh, supplements as well. And it's, it's something that's naturally found in our brains as well. Um, Are you so eating the fish or taking supplements for the... Uh... I take supplements because I don't really eat a lot of fish. Uh, I don't want to eat a lot of fish either. So I just take a daily supplement. Um, you can find those anywhere in, in many different ways, but um, that's a big one. And then again, things that are, are antioxidants. So redu reducing inflammation in the body overall will help you have a clearer mind. So um, you can find lists of things of good foods that are, are antioxidants that are, that are good for your brain. Mm -hmm. So what is your diet? What, what's the one you found uh, when you're on your memory is the sharpest? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I don't do it always, but I try to do, you know, 30 to 50 days in a row and then maybe take a break and then come back to it. But I, I've been really interested and, and happy with the re results from keto, a keto diet. Uh, diet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar, but... Um, I'm eating keto myself. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. So, you know. Um, yeah. High fat, low carbs, um, moderate protein. And um, the... I've never felt better and, and sharper in my, in my life. Um, I have a sweet tooth. I like, uh, things that are sweet and desserts. So, um, but I also feel like crap after I eat them. So, um, there's definitely a big, big thing to be said about eating healthy. Mm -hmm. And do you drink a coffee as well? I don't drink coffee. I just, I don't like it. I never grew up liking it. I also don't drink alcohol. Um, these aren't lifestyle choices. It's just, I never really um, became one of those people that loves to have a, a nice drink or a nice coffee. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about, uh, let's say the championship on the days when you actually have the championship, is your diet a bit different or it's the same, maybe keto diet, which you're having day to day, or are you doing something different on those days? Yeah. Yeah. No, I try to, 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 to stricken up my keto as best as possible. So very limited carbs. And actually when I go into competition the day of, uh, I try to fast quite a bit. I try to be actually a bit hungry um, because I found that when I'm hungry, I'm actually a bit better at memorizing. Really? Um, it's, I, I don't know if it's just something I made up in my head, but um, I feel like I'm a little more alert. Um, maybe it's kind of a natural uh, instinctive thing where, you know, as a, as a species, you know, when you're hungry, it means you're in, you gotta be searching for food. So you're more alert, right? Um, so that, that seems to help me kind of, it doesn't feel good because I'm hungry. I want to eat something, but it also makes me focus on, on what I'm doing for the moment. Really? So you think fasting in general, um, a certain amount of time can help you be sharper and have a better memory? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, Interesting. Also, before competition, sleep. Uh, sleep is super important. Um, I've been very challenged by that with my my newborn uh, son uh-huh. <laughs> waking up a lot. But um, you know, I definitely notice when I don't get a, a good night's sleep how difficult it is for me to to keep all these images in my head. Uh, nothing runs as smoothly when I, I'm, I'm missing sleep. So I try to get as much as I can before a competition. How sleep? Uh, which percentage sleep plays a role? You mean? I mean, how important it is? Uh... Uh, it's maybe not so much an immediate effect, but um, it can be something that over time adds up. So I don't know if you're getting like five hours of sleep, you know, for two weeks straight. Um, I think that would just totally floor me, um, you know, but if it's one night a week like that, that's not so good. And then everything else is like seven to eight hours. I think I'm okay. Uh, mm-hmm. I try to average around seven um, and that seems to work. Uh, are you doing anything to optimize your sleep, which is notable? I should, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's it's right now it's just like a free for all. I, I, yeah, I gotta. I'm always getting out of the bed to to soothe the baby, and um, I just when I come back to bed, I just fall asleep, you know. But I'm sure there are things we could do to make our room more isolated or the bed more comfortable. I don't know, but I haven't explored that much with that yet. Do you think if you will and you will improve your sleep, uh, you'll be able to be better in the memory? I would, yeah. I, I definitely think sleep is probably one of the areas I could probably improve in um, to get mm-hmm. more sound sleep, um, more quality sleep. Um, I definitely think that that would make a huge difference. Mm-hmm. How about meditation? Do you meditate? I don't meditate. Um, never really been interested in it, but. Um, when I talk to people who are very interested in it, I find that it's almost very similar to what I do when I train, um, my memory, really? because, you know, some, most of the time I'm memorizing for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And it's the only thing I'm doing. Right. And the, the whole point of it is to block out any distractions while I analyze this information and turn it into pictures. And, you know, of course I have inner voices talking to me and helping me distract uh, from the, the task, but I have to block those out and sound very similar to when people are just listening to their breath, focusing on their breath and they stray and they have to f- find their center again. Right. Um, and that, that's kind of what I do. So maybe, maybe that's my meditation, you know? Really? So you, you think when you're learning, um, numbers or anything that has to do with memory, you're basically sort of really meditative state. I think so. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a great relaxing, um, kind of escape for me as well. I, after I train, I, I really feel rejuvenate, rejuvenated and uh, kind of refreshed uh, in a way and also more confident because I've, I've worked and exercised my memory, you know? Interesting. Do you use any background music that helps your training or like no music uh, when you're training? Uh, usually no. Uh, I try to m- just block out everything. I wear these big can- noise canceling headphones and sometimes I wear visors to cover my peripheral vision but um sometimes i will train with noise um but not to relax it's more to um distract me and for me to to force me to try to block it out you know really yeah. interesting um so we mentioned a few things which when it comes to memory learning i'm, I'm wondering what do you think is the 2080 of memory learning if someone uh, maybe listening in they want to focus on this topic and really start improving their memory, what is the 20% you think which can give the 80% of the results? Uh, from, from yeah, yeah, good question. Because, yeah, most people don't want to or don't care to be a, a champion, right? But I guess would, most don't, yeah. Right. But most would love to have uh, an incredible memory to memorize their day to day stuff. So, yeah. like I said, I think everything that I've said already is probably the 20% that you need to have 80% of the results. Um, mm-hmm. And then you know, practice, 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 depends how much you want to practice. You can take that, you know, get that remaining 20%. Um, but it's, it's just something you got to give a little bit of love to and, and understand the process, which I've explained um, as simply as possible. You know, there's little nuances, right? And you can read more about the specifics of each of those uh, bits in my book. But um, I think more or less, if you think about memory in the way that I've said, um, that's a huge jump. Uh, to how most people think about their memory 
and it'll give you tremendous uh, improvements. Interesting. Um, one thing I'm curious about, I saw on your website, you had a mind show interviews where basically you had your own show where you interviewed other memory masters. So what I'm curious is like being a USA memory championship, did you learn something from others? And if yes, like what did you learn from other people who are also um, yeah. masters at the topic? Good question. Yeah. I haven't done an interview from, for that show in, in many years, but I had a, a good number of people on it for a while. Um, it wasn't only memory. Some people on there were uh, mental calculators, right? Usually something mind related, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, what I learned is like people, you know, I trained for so many years a certain way and I thought that was the one way to do it. And nobody could excel outside of that. And I learned that from other people in, in the same kind of space. It's true to an extent, but people have their own way of, of practicing. Like one, one memory champion, Alex Mullen, uh, he's won the world championship as well. He doesn't train as hard as I do, um, but he is better <laughs> and was able to get better much quicker. So right. it's interesting, but, but then maybe that has something to do with um, how he trains, uh, how he analyzes his results, um, the feedback he gets from that. Um, maybe he's training smarter than me and he knows something that I don't. So, um, yeah, there's little things like that that I picked up on that um, helped me understand, you know, differences between the pe way people approach a problem and try to fix it. You know, there's not one f final solution, you know, to this. I give a suggestion in my book and my teachings, um, but it doesn't always uh, work exactly for everybody. Um, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that you have a bad memory still. Uh, it just means that you have to maybe figure out some other way that works for you, um, that motivates you, that gets you excited, that helps you see improvements, you know? Mm -hmm. How many hours um, are you training and how many hours uh, the guy you brought as an example trains? Uh, just to give people an idea. Yeah, so when I was really in the middle of my, my peak a uh, number of years ago co competing, I would train four to five hours a day, um, mm -hmm. spread out, not all in a row. Um, and from what I understand from Alex, he would only train 30 minutes a day, no more. 30 minutes um, a day, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is crazy. I wish I could have spent 30 minutes a day. Uh, but, um, but yeah, nowadays, right now, I maybe train 30 minutes, but I'm not trying to win anything right now. Um, but the, the U.S. Championship was a few weeks ago, and I was training very hard for that, doing many hours a day. But uh, I pulled back now that it's kind of off-season. Mm -hmm. Do you plan going back uh, every year right now? Um, how do you see yourself like from that perspective? Uh, I don't know. Um, I was hoping to win the championship this year. I came in second place. Um, oh, I was very close to winning, but I, I didn't pull through. So I was hoping that this would be it and then I could kind of be happy with that. But um, I say this every year, you know, that I think it's the last year I'm going to compete, but I love, I love competing. I love memorizing. It's just something that is very, calming and, and fun to me i get to kind of go in my own head and 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 escape it's it, it's really a a relaxing and addicting kind of hobby interesting um i have the following memory question i know today in the online world you can use calendars you can use lists to mention we have our phones which can uh, store all our contacts uh do you use any calendars or to-do lists or really anything to help you memorize or you try on purpose to kind of keep your memory sharp and use the techniques you have to memorize everything to kind of keep you uh on the edge maybe to say so so i do a bit of both um I th my excuse is that uh, I spend many hours just training for these competitions, numbers, um, words, all these kinds of things. And by the time it comes to my to-do lists and appointments, I'm just like, I'm exhausted, you know? So sometimes, to be honest, I just use my device for those. Um, but then, you know, especially in the beginning, I was very interested in how I could use these techniques to help my actual personal life. Um, and, and still to this day, there's some things that I do that will always uh, start with memory. For example, memorizing um, people's names. I always memorize their names. Um, phone numbers as well. Like if I meet someone, I always try to ask for their phone number uh, and memorize it um, until I get home at least, you know, and then I put it in my phone um, uh, and store it. But I try to make that process 
where I memorize it first. Um, same with to-do lists uh, or, or, or like um, grocery lists, sorry, when I'm going out. I don't try to write them down. Uh, my wife writes them down a lot, but I try to memorize them and then go. Um, just these little things here to try to kind of live by what I say, you know? Mm -hmm. Got it. And do you think people should um, minimize using such lists in their life as just as a gradually using their memory? Like, do they hurt? Because it's so easy not to remember anything. Everything can be digitized. Yeah, I mean... Look, the technology is great. Uh, I'm not saying don't use it, it's the devil. Um, and, and maybe use it more than not, that's fine. But I think from time to time, it's okay to try to use your own smartphone, right? Well, that's in your head. Um, and at the same time, you're doing it good. So um, there's the argument for that. Um, but yeah, don't go crazy over it. Just have fun with it. That, again, that's the thing. If you're stressed out, oh, I gotta memorize my, my list to go then don't do it because uh, you're going to hate yourself. And then if you forget it, when you go to the store, you're going to hate yourself even more and, and <laughs> throw away my book, you know? Um, so, so do what it makes you excited. Um, what you'll find though, as you memorize your lists, um, it's, it's a really interesting and addictive kind of talent to have. You feel like you have a superhuman power. Um, so that's, that's kind of the exciting thing of it. It makes you want to do it more. Um, so try it. And if it's for you, keep doing it. If not, try to find something else that you like to memorize and use that to practice. Interesting. Um, Nelson, is there anything else I should have asked you on the topic of memory, in your opinion? No, man, you, you got a good number of questions in there. They're very good questions. I think you're good. All right, yeah. Uh, we can start wrapping up. We're close to the time we have for this. So, um, Nelson, where can people find you online? Where can people find uh, your book? And where can people go if they want to kind of improve uh, their memory? Yeah, so you, they can start by going to my website. It's nelsondellis.com. Um, <clears throat> they can subscribe to my newsletter. Um, there's links to my videos on YouTube. My YouTube channel has a lot of um, tips and tricks on how to do these techniques and how to learn specific things. Um, I put a lot of effort into those videos, so I think you should definitely check those out. Um, and then my book as well, I'm very proud of it. I think it's something that is very helpful to a lot of people. So that's called Remember It, and uh, people can find it in most bookstores anywhere. Um, yeah, I'll link to all of those in the show notes. And I did read Nelson's book just before the call. I haven't read every word. I was skimming for some parts and I think it's a great book. So everyone listening in who wants to improve my memory, um, there's really lots of interesting and great stuff kind of to expand on the conversation. Um, we had today, um, Nelson, thank you very much for taking the time and sharing, uh, your knowledge and everything you know about, uh, memory. Great, man. Thanks for having me. I'm Excited to be on your show and, and thank you so much. Best of luck. All right. Sounds cool. Take care. Bye.